play with you well and one girl one woman <laughs> and uh, Ingrid and I was like man we gotta talk because you know it's like everyone keeps mentioning your name like Mike Formanek and Byrne and all these guys and it's just <laughs> like wow okay gotta connect the dots now oh by the way I spoke spoke to John a bear last week and he said I should say like <laughs> some doos or doozy or <laughs> what <laughs> that's a that's a joke I have with his uh, with his nine-year-old kid <laughs> ah, okay, yeah. He was like, yeah, I, settled, I, I said to him, like, yeah, I'm speaking to Mary next week. And he was like, oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's cool. Yeah, I just talked to him yesterday, actually. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. yeah. yeah he's a fun guy. I, I love John. So. But anyway, I, I, I'd like to start, you know, just, just ask you about one thing first, which is like uh, your connection to guitar players, musical connection. And... Uh, I listened like to this uh, Miles Okazaki duo you guys did in Jazz Fest Sarajevo, mm -hmm. and it's so cool because you know it's again a different vibe you guys make. But uh, I wanted to ask you this: like, how do you because it was a free impro? Mm -hmm. How do you jump into a free impro concert or thing as a musician? Like. Do you tell yourself what to do? I mean, I spoke with Tom Rainey about that and I played with Tom and, you know, Tom can do like one symbol for two minutes and yeah. he's just, he stands behind it and I want to see how do you do that or you approach that, the free improvisation kind of? Um, I mean, I think actually the Tom Rainey's trio that I play in with Ingrid, which is all improvised, is is a good example I think uh, of how I like to approach it, which is kind of thinking compositionally, challenging yeah. yourself to create structures in the moment. And Tom is is really good at that. Um, yeah. Just having the confidence to stick with an idea and develop something, but also being open to it going off the rails at any moment. Yeah. Um, so that's been really cool working with that group because sometimes we'll actually create something that that feels like, oh, that was... It could have been a, a melody that was written or something, or even yeah. go into some kind of vampy thing or something that yeah. we created in the moment. Um, I, I do like to create structure and, and think structurally a lot of the time. Um, and with Miles, it was interesting because we've never played duo before. We've played yeah. together a bunch um, in my quartet, mostly playing John Zorn's music. Um, but we didn't you know discuss anything we just decided to improvise and see what happened and it almost felt similar like we we created these little almost vignettes you know they were probably yeah, like yeah. four or five minute songs and just that that's the other challenge too is when you're doing that to have them all be different so it's not like you're doing the same piece every time or, or trying to yeah. create some kind of variety in space and and um you know some days you're more successful at it than others i think that's the the thing about free improv, which can be really beautiful, is when you're on, you feel really on. And yeah. as you know, I'm sure. And then some yeah. days you just, you know, it's like you're taking risks. And, and some yeah. days you, you might fall on your face a little bit, but yeah. that's okay. But uh, I mean, do you, as a guitarist, like, a, you know, do you think about what you will do? Or are you just like in a sense of like, okay, I will now begin with a staccato, whatever line, or, you know, or... Or how do you get an idea where to how to start? I mean, I'm really curious. I mean, I, I usually feel if I think, okay, I'm going to start this way and I'm going to do this thing, it to me that's often it ends up not being successful. Yeah. <laughs> if I yeah, think about yeah. it too much in advance, so I really try to not think about it until the moment that I'm going to do it. Yeah. Um, and again, there, there's always varying degrees of success with this stuff, but I feel like if I if I can turn off the more intellectual part of my brain as much as possible and just go intuitively, I, I usually feel like I have the best result. 
Um, yeah. And I think to me, I mean, that's kind of how I think about music anyway. To me, it's yeah. really more of an emotional, intuitive <clears throat> type of thing than than a than an intellectual thing. So trying to turn that part of your brain off, I mean, you know, we can't do it entirely. Yeah. Uh, but but it usually helps me to to not be thinking about. And there's also, you know, your focus is different on different days. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And who you play with, I guess, of course. I mean, yeah, sure. Definitely. Yeah. No, it's it's funny because, you know, what you said, like, uh, I also feel the same. If if I think about what more, what I'm going to play, it usually sucks. So <laughs> <it's> like, <laughs> you know, like, I'll start with minor seconds or something, and then it's like, yikes, okay. It's, or, yeah, yeah. That's sometimes your brain is telling you, ah, oh, this sucks. <laughs> yeah. That's the worst. Yeah. I had I had so many bad gigs, gigs like that. <laughs> Seriously, like I, I remember what, what we did one tour two years ago with Tony Malaby, and you know he's like for me the genius, like the master yeah. improviser. He's such a beautiful and, improviser. Yeah, and he can just go anywhere, and you know it was just like watching him. I was like, man, you can do this like every night just flow and I, sometimes i was just like struggling like oh, like you know <laughs> so much to learn still but uh, in, in this improvised area how imp like uh, i listen to a couple, many records these days with you on that i have and one of like that i really like i'm a huge joe morris fan and the traversing orbits that you guys did i think it was two years ago right uh, or three now no three uh Joe, for me, is like, you know, I, I, I did this interview with him and I told him, like, one of the greatest records, guitar records for me is the solo record he did, the solo guitar. Oh, yeah. It goes, it's like up there with Virtuoso of Joe Pass or many others. And mm -hmm. But how important was Joe for you in your guitar or musical development it's since he was, I think, your mentor, right? Yeah, I mean, I... Let's see, I, I first saw Joe perform, I remember it was, I was in college, um, and it was when Roulette was still, um, Roulette was in, in Tribeca at that point, and it was in, um, Jim Staley, the director, was in his loft, so he, that was when the concerts were still happening in his loft, and wow. I went to see Joe play duo with William Parker, Oh wow! and, and I was just completely blown away, um, so I... I I worked up the courage to go up and say, hey, do you teach lessons? And, and, he, and he said he did. And I was in college in Connecticut, and he, um, he was, well, I guess at that point he hadn't moved there, but he shortly after that moved to Connecticut. So he actually lived uh, pretty close to where I was going to school. So I would drive to his house for lessons every week. Uh -huh. And, um, I mean, it was amazing. I mean, he's also, in addition to being, and I agree with you, he's, he's on that level. He's a brilliant improviser. I, yeah. I actually think also that he's, Severely underappreciated, I, I think. Yeah, I oh, yeah. I know about him. Um, but also, he's a brilliant teacher. Um, and so that that was really amazing for me to get to study with him. And how, I tell the story that look? all the time. Joe's sick of hearing me tell the story. Everybody's sick of hearing me tell the story. Oh, but, no, please. <laughs> I, I didn't hear it. Yes. <laughs> but, you know, I, I'm like 19 years old and I, I want to sound like Joe, you know. And, and so I went there being like, oh, I can play guitar duets with Joe and Joe refused to play guitar in the lessons. He would play upright bass yeah. because he didn't want me to imitate what he was doing. And that was, it was such a strong lesson to me of being like, Oh, he, he's my hero on guitar, but that doesn't mean that I should try to do exactly what he's doing. Yeah. Um, so he, his thing was like, find your own thing. Um, so that was such a strong message to me. And I think really helped me kind of figure out just musically what I was going for. Yeah. You know, we would just improvise and talk, and um, it was it was kind of like a not only musical but also like a theoretical kind of stuff that we were getting into. So it was it was hugely important to me. Mm -hmm. And then you know, fast forward later, um, you know, we're still friends, we're still in touch, we play together. Um, but you know, finally we got a chance to make that guitar duo record that yeah. I I probably wanted to do when I was nineteen. So it was under your initiative, initiative or or kind of like both decided to do it or you know i don't remember we probably just were talking and, yeah. and said we should do this um but what was cool about that record we, we had sort of a happy accident um which was we had decided we were going to play with guitar pedals you know we we're going to improvise with with all our pedals so we show up at the studio and my line six just decided to die 
Uh, oh, yeah. I've been there so I'm also. trying everything and the, the engineer has one and we're trying to get it working and plug it in. It's just not working at all. And so we're like, you know what? Fuck it. Let's just let's just go straight to the amp. No pedals. And I'm so glad that that happened because yeah. I, I really like I, I think it's a better record. Um, just that, that we use no pedals and just um, yeah. basically it's, I mean, it's almost an acoustic record. Um, yeah, like and a- what's even funnier is my line six started working again the next day. <laughs> so wow! I think it, just, it, it wanted that record to happen without pedals like it was yeah but did you guys also do concerts like um, as a duo forever, we've done a couple concerts duo oh wow um not nice. for a while but but we have and hopefully yeah. we'll do some more if concerts ever come back uh, yeah <laughs> that would be nice actually <laughs> like yeah I, I will not go there even. <laughs> but but yeah but no, no it's it's amazing you you played with so many of my guitar heroes you know like joe is there and you you know bill frizzell you did that amazing bill frizzell record and i also wanted to ask you about bill you know he, he's if joe morris is like the hero who's really underrated at least bill got that <laughs> part covered yeah. but you know for me he's like one of the most important composers and guitarists because he's so egoless and mm-hmm. he serves the music and i wanted to ask you how did you guys hook up together and that record you did was so beautiful i mean thank you um yeah i mean it, it was like a dream for me to get to work with him um i mean i've i've met him i mean i don't know i i, I think i met him through chess smith maybe oh yeah but- I've, I've known him for a long time, just, I mean, I would, I've gone and heard him play a million times. Every time he would play at the Vanguard with um, oh, yeah. Joe Lovano and Paul Motion, I was there every time. And I mean, I'm, I'm a huge fan of his music going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but that record was actually John Zorn's idea. Oh, um, really? Just... We recorded it for Zodic, John Zorn's label. Yeah. And the reason uh, Zorn thought of it is because he knew that me and Bill Purcell are both a huge fans of Johnny Smith. Um, so he wanted us to do a tribute record to Johnny Smith, Smith yeah. um, which was amazing. Cause I, again, talk about underappreciated guitar players. I also feel like it, it's interesting to me. And I was in this category for many years. I didn't discover Johnny Smith until, you know, probably 15 years ago. Yeah, um, should it's be... amazing to me how many yeah. guitar players don't know about Johnny Smith. So it was yeah. cool to get the chance to do a tribute to Johnny Smith and to get to collaborate with Bill, which was also a, a dream. Yeah, but did did you like, I mean, how did you decide for the repertoire and all that? You know, he's for me up there. I I listened just today to his records, you know, that I don't know what's the name, but that it has uh, Embraceable You and Misty and all that on it. It's it's incredible what he plays there. It's just like beyond. But how did you guys decide what to play and uh, how to do it, actually, that one? Um, Well, we wanted to do Walk, Don't Run because that was his his composition the, that, the, every breath you take yeah like oh, oh, it's, Smith, it's so yeah. good so we wanted to do that for sure and then i think we just chose um you know standards that he performed often and i actually transcribed a, a few his versions of a few of them oh, wow. um, the nearness of you and um scarlet ribbons and yeah. That's a nice uh, the, uh made with the flax and hair i think um and and then Bill actually studied with Johnny Smith when he was a teenager. Yeah, I've read that. Yeah, yeah. That's I mean, amazing. He got that he got a chance to uh, to study with Johnny Smith. So he had some handwritten charts that he still that he I, can, I think he couldn't find all of them, but he found a few of them. Wow. Um, so we were so we did have most of them are standards, but we either did them in the style that that Johnny played them, or they were transcriptions, or they were um, charts that that Bill had from his days studying with Johnny. So it was, it was really cool. And then, you know, we, we tried to do our own thing with it too. And some of them became more open, had more improvising, yeah. some of them stuck to the tunes a little more, but it was, I mean, he's so easy to improvise with. Um, really? Oh my God. Yeah. It's just, yeah. it's amazing. He's so musical and, and he has such big ears. Um, and we got to do right before the pandemic, actually, we did like a, I don't know, week-long tour where we got to play this stuff every night and um that was that was amazing yeah like i almost wish we could have recorded i guess you always feel like this we could have recorded the record after the tour because it opened up so much you know throughout the course of yeah sure are are there some bootlegs or something like 
going somewhere? I'd love to hear that. Not that I know of, but probably, Damn, okay. <laughs> probably if you dig around, you could yeah, find Yeah, I'll ask around and go, go <laughs> in the dark web, you know, like, <laughs> no, but that's fun, uh, cool. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's incredible. I, I, I'm so, I've been Bill, you know, like uh, you know that's uh, that video lessons that he did, like it's on VHS, like on videotapes, like his solo guitar playing. Were you and talking about Bill or or Johnny? About Bill, Bill. Oh, about Bill, because yeah. Johnny has some as well. <laughs> really? Yeah, there. The, I think it's actually on YouTube, but somebody had, I think transferred a VHS to digital I'll check it out. teaching anyway but yeah, but, but, but no Bill is like so so like on that one you have to check it out like he plays like I don't know days of wine and roses and he you know plays like one harmonic or something and it's kind of a wrong note but then he explains like yeah then I went for it and you know it's so cool because anyway yeah yeah I mean sometimes the best ideas player. come from mistakes yeah, you know or, yeah, or even right. like Maybe, maybe maybe that's not what you meant, but thinking about that of like if you hit a wrong note, just like digging in and building yeah. something around that, as opposed to being like, ah, shit. Yeah, yeah, no, he he's you know he's the perfect example. Like all these guys, I mean, Joe Morris and Bill and you actually and yeah. everyone, I guess. You know, so. But uh, yeah, I, I mean, the reason I also wanted to, to talk to you now, like these days, is also because you have you, you have a new record out. Uh, and uh, it's incredible. First, it, it sounds like to me, maybe it will be a wrong description, but to me, it sounds like early Genesis with Peter Gabriel or something. <laughs> I love it. Seriously, I don't know why. Maybe because of Robert Wyatt also or something. It has this lyrical prog rockish vibe to it. And uh, but I wanted to ask you about the this new one, Artless Falling, like. Uh, how did you approach it differently than the first Code Girl? Um, well, a couple of things were different. I, I guess the the main difference to the the main thing that set it apart was that I decided to write all the lyrics in different poetic forms, whereas the first one was just kind of haphazard. I would just write something without thinking about form. But with this one, I wrote them all in different forms. Yeah. So I have like a Sestina. That's the title track. Is the Sestina. Um, and a, a high boon, which is like a a form that's a little bit of more of an elaborate haiku. Um, yeah. And you know a um, a pantoum, all these different forms. So I kind of studied forms and then tried to write in the forms. And but I did you like? Did you study literature or something? I mean, I, I studied American literature and poetry basically. So I love what you did here. But how did you? How did you start? with poetry, I mean, with writing, basically, these lyrics? Um, I mean, it's it's always something I've been interested in casually, although I never I never studied. I mean, I've taken literature courses and things, but okay. I never studied it in some kind of a, a serious way, and I never studied poetry. But I've always liked it, so I've always experimented with it um, mm. from time to time. And I've written song lyrics occasionally over the years, so I think this was sort of a challenge to myself to put some more dedicated study into it. And and it was actually really cool because, you know, when you're an artist, in my case, a guitar player, that's all you do. But if you if you have an outlet where you can have like a different type of creative expression, mm -hmm. it, it's really fun. You know, you feel like a, a kid with like a totally new, yeah. you know, as if I, I was like sitting down on a drum set for the first time. Like it feels like wide open terrain, I think. Yeah. You don't have so many hang ups. You know, I think be, I think it's a good thing that I didn't study poetry because I didn't really have anybody telling me like, oh, that's wrong or you can't do it this way. You know, it, it felt just like, yeah, I could do whatever I want. Um, yeah. It was very difficult. It took me way longer to write the words than it did to write the music. Did like, you always write, write the music. words on the music or did you like sometimes start the other way? I always wrote the words first because then the words, oh, okay. the words inform the structure of the song. So if, the, okay. if there's like an irregular number of syllables or if there's a rhyme scheme or a, a few different stanzas, I would have then a, a few different sections of the oh, song. Wow. So I, I kind of like it actually made it easier to write the music because it, it was almost like the structure of the words then um, made clear the structure of the music. Yeah, makes sense. So I always yeah. do it that way. Um, I've always written, when I have a music with words, I always write the words first. Also, because it, oh. it informs the mood. Because then you know what the song's about. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, that was the first main 
difference. Also, I have some new people in the band. Yeah. Um, Adam yeah. O'Farrell, Marie, Maria Grand, and then Robert Wyatt as a special guest, um, who's like my hero. So that was amazing. Like um, from Soft Machine days already, or like everything. Yeah. Played. I mean, his solo music, I, I love Soft Machine too, but his solo music really, starting with Rock Bottom, um, is it's probably that's one of my all-time favorite albums for sure I'll check it out I, I don't know if he solo stuff at all so oh man yeah if, if you like soft machine yeah. um, you'll be into it but it's very different too it's his own thing um but yeah check out rock bottom that that was his okay cool 1974 yeah. album oh. um oh. and there's tons of others that are amazing too i think because that's the first one i heard it, it you know it carries a special uh, how did the, the co collaboration happen you just contacted him and he was up for it or sort of I mean Robert Wyatt's one of those people and I've noticed this over the years people either say who's that or they they're absolutely obsessed with him you know, okay. the okay. so there's there's a small group of people I know um, who are obsessed with him and you know okay. you'll notice like uh, there was a there was a bar a venue in New York that since closed, but but the owners w w were always playing Robert Wyatt. So I started talking to them because every time I went into the bar, uh, Robert Wyatt was playing, and so they knew I was a fan. And um, this is probably I don't I have no sense of time 10, 15 years ago. Um, and they came up to me and they said, "Oh hey, you know we mail him a package every year. He he loves jazz and we he loves vinyl, so we mail him a bunch of records every year. Would you like to include something?" And so I said, yeah, great. So I, I sent him, I don't remember what it was, some album I had done, and I wrote him a little note. And I get a postcard okay. back in the mail. Wow. Um, which is amazing. I mean, who takes the time to do that? So he actually listened to it and wrote me like a really nice note. Um, and then that kind of started a correspondence. So, wow. I mean, pretty much everything I release, I'll, I'll mail to him in the UK. Um, and we started emailing at a, at a certain point. So we were in touch, you know, not regularly, but often enough and I thought you know I really wanted to have a, a special guest singer on it and it was it was my dream to have him but I thought you know it's probably a pipe dream mostly because <laughs> I, I read an interview with him I think this was like in 2014 or something where he said he, he had stopped making music so I thought yeah there's I almost didn't even ask because I thought well I don't think he's going to do it anyway plus I, I read this interview where he said he was done um, but I thought, well, you know what, I'm, I'm in touch with them anyway, it can't hurt. So I, yeah. I just sent him an email and said, you know, would you be interested in singing a few songs on this record? And, and he wrote back and said, I'd love to. Wow. And I was That's genuinely beautiful. shocked. Like, I really thought, you know, he's not going to do it. But yeah. what was great is, um, it was amazing. And he, he's like the nicest person in the world and, and he's brilliant. And, um, he had agreed to do it before I wrote any of the music. So then I was able to write all the music with, with him in mind. So yeah writing these songs, knowing that he was going to be the one singing them, which which gave me a lot of inspiration. Yeah. Just knowing that it was going to be him and, and trying to picture his voice on these songs. So, yeah, yeah it was really like I always say, but it really was a dream come true. I never no, thought sure. that would happen to get a chance to work with him. That's It's amazing also because of the backing vocals. Yeah. Like, you know, it's like. It, it adds this amazing quality. I think Maria Grant sings, right? The backing vocals. And, so and Martha, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, of course. I mean, it's it's such a nice flow. That, that's what makes, has this prog rock vibe to me. I don't know. Why. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Yeah, but, but uh, also, like, I wanted to ask you, like, when I listen in general to your music, but also in co- how do you divide the sections of composed and improvised in a way like I mean you said like you like improvise free improvising also in a composed way so and all, all of your music sounds even if it's improvised it's almost composed if it makes sense but I wanted to ask you where's that border between how do you structure a song or a composition in your head like um, I mean it also it depends on the project like I would course. say yeah. I would say Code Girl is the most highly structured project yeah. that I have because I really am thinking about it like a song project. So there is a lot of improvising, but it's always within a framework. Mm -hmm. So usually um, it'll be pretty set, like who solos when, and it's all kind of in service to the song. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, there'll be some moments where um, things will happen that maybe are, are outside of that. And and definitely in the live performances, you know, the songs are like twice as long and, and people are oh, well. going different places. But for the record, I wanted it to be, you know, really more of just these are the songs and there is improvising, but it's not... Um, it's not, I, I wanted it to feel seamless. Um, yeah. And it, yeah, it really depends. Like some, some projects, most of my projects have some composed element, um, but, but some of them are way more improvisational than, than yeah, others. Sure. But I think sure. regardless, what, what I like is, is when you kind of can't tell, like it, it, where you don't have the feeling of like, now it's the composed part. Now it's the improvised yeah. part. Now they're back. And, and so what I, what I try to do when I have both, elements is to have them happen in different ways so it's not always like a composed section and then it goes completely free and then another composed so sometimes it might be that sometimes there might be um soloing over a form sometimes Mm -hmm. it might be soloing over something else which isn't exactly a form but maybe it's some figure or um, a vamp or something like that Um, sometimes it might be just a solo instrument or a duet Mm -hmm. or sometimes it i want to leave it so that it could be anybody um, and, and not set who is doing, uh, who is soloing at a certain point. Or maybe it's not yeah. a solo, maybe it's a collective improvisation. Um, so just switching up the ways in which it happens, or maybe there's improvising happening simultaneously when there's a composed section. Because, yeah. um, you know, you see bands, like I'm, I'm thinking of Wayne Shorter's quartet, um, yeah. I, which I've seen live a couple times and I never have any clue what's going on. Like I, I really don't know when they're improvising and when. Yeah. That's such a group. Yeah. And, and to me, that's really exciting. I love that. So that, that's something I, I aspire to do too. Again, less than code girl. Cause that, that's more of a structured yeah. thing, but, but to try to just have it be a little more fluid b- between those two concepts. But do you, I mean, at least when I envision a composition or when I do a project, I actually write down stuff that, you know, here I would like a duo, here I would like a solo. Do you also do that? Like that you have like then a set of 10 tunes or whatever, how many, like that you would then like think about the whole composition of the album, like. Yeah, absolutely. I I do that too. I mean, I I definitely think if I'm writing a a bunch of pieces, which are going to be, you know, a set of music or a record or something, I definitely think about the balance. Mm, okay. of, of yeah. the different elements so yeah you know if, if there's like i'll make sure that everybody has a space within yeah. that um but I, these days i feel kind of like moving a little bit away from that um oh, okay. and having it more be like let people claim their space within something that's a little bit more open so that's kind of what i'm moving into next but that's the thing i like to i like to switch it up a little bit i, yeah. I like loosening up on the structural elements a bit right now. That's just how I'm feeling now. But, uh, what, what's in the bin? What, what are you cooking right now? I mean, speaking of next. So. Um, well, I'm writing, I guess right now, I, I had written a bunch of music for a new sextet project and oh, then wow. all the gigs got canceled, but I wrote all the music. Yeah. So the music is done. Yeah. Um, and I've been thinking about adding some strings. So I'm writing some stuff for string quartet and maybe for both. Oh maybe both projects simultaneously and also separately. Yeah. Um, so that's still kind of in its early stages, but um, yeah, I've been studying some orchestration stuff and just trying to think about that, which is, which has been a lot of fun. Yeah. I love that too, yeah. But yeah, I think this project will be a, a little more loosely structured, at least in the sex set part of it. Yeah. But the, the, you, when you mentioned writing music, what's your, what's your process? I mean, do you like, do you have like a daily process, daily time that, that you devote to composition that you say like, okay, now I'm going to write and compose or it's just when it happens or? Um, it's more when it happens. I think okay. you know, some some days I'm not composing at all. Some days I'm, I, I definitely practice guitar every day um, or every day that I'm home, um, which has yeah. been every day this year. That's been actually amazing yeah, yeah. practice every day. Um, but composing, I'll, I'll do kind of when I'm in that zone, you know, so like right now I'm composing quite a bit because I'm thinking about this project, but you know, when I finish that music, I might have a couple months where I don't compose at all. Um, it yeah. just, it just depends on what's going on. Do you have that? Do you have a very structured way that you I mean, practice and compose? 
I think everyone will come out of this uh, lockdown like insanely technical players. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, I'm just, you know, like noodling on the instrument constantly. But no, no like for composition. I mean, I always, I think you also or everyone, like you envision first the players that are going to be involved because, but uh, I, I used to have, or I still do have this routine that, you know, when I get an idea, I'll just write it down, whether it's like a two bar structure and I'll put it on the, among the huge pile of sheets. Yeah. And uh, that's then when I have the, the project in the, you know, in my mind, what I want to do, then I take those little pieces and I start working on them and yeah that's how I kind of approach although then then I get have this problem now that's why I'm talking to all you guys like how do you solve the compositional problems because you know sometimes I feel like I've written you know so much so much everything sounds the same I, I feel like I'm repeating myself so you know how to solve this 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 is a question for you, actually. Yeah. How, how do you solve this, like, that you yeah, keep the freshness going? Because I think there, there is there's like a, a fine line between having a compositional voice and just straight up repeating yourself. <laughs> you know, so yeah, yeah. I mean, for me, at least. I don't know. No, I know. I, I think for me, one thing that's helpful is just to, to write for different instruments and, and different projects. And yeah. sometimes that'll force me into a different space because... You know, for example, writing for voice is very different than writing for a saxophone. Like, I would never write the same melody no. for a saxophone that I would for voice. So it kind of sometimes just writing for different projects um, pushes me into a different space. Um, sometimes just practicing guitar yeah. um, gives me some yeah. new ideas. And I actually do a similar thing to you, where if I have, like, a little tiny idea, I'll just jot it down and kind of yeah, save it for right. later. Um, but, you know, if you do enough of those, hopefully you get one or two that you feel is a little different. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I do a, a similar thing, um, and also just try not to worry about it too much. Like, yeah. I've definitely had that where I've, I've written something, and I'll be like, "Wow, that's really similar to something else I wrote." But also just being like, "Okay, well." <laughs> yeah, it's not nothing wrong with it. Yeah, I mean, you know, but it's just like sometimes, that, you know, that's why lately I, I love doing free and pro because at least in that area, it's like, okay, it's you know. <laughs> It's one thing less to worry in, like not to repeating. Of course, then you're stuck with your own technical and right, psychological right. issues or whatever. <laughs> but no, just like this compositional routine. That's, I guess, the, the, I always. I, I think always. I try to listen to different music also. Yeah. Before every project, you know, like if I always gonna listen to I don't know Henry Treadgill, it's gonna be like. You know, I love it or whatever, but then I'm start everything gonna be in that vein or you know, so definitely I think listening is key, you know, just checking out as much stuff as possible. Um you do that as well, like that you listen to music all the time and search for ideas or Yeah, I mean actually this year I have more music on around the house this year than ever. Um, oh yeah, Makes mostly because my, my neighbors are really loud, so I'm trying to drown out the sounds. Oh. So just like have music on constantly. And so that was the initial reason why. But then once I started having it on all the time, I was like, this is great. You know, just listening to whatever. What, um, what, what did you listen to? Like, let's say that's some five artists that you would you could highlight that like were really like, wow. I mean, it changes. I mean, sometimes like today I had on. I actually had on Coltrane today and, and Dolby. Oh, yeah. And then yesterday I was listening to. Um, uh, Caroline Shaw's string quartet, the Orange, that album, uh, or Orange with the Ataka Quartet. Really? Um, uh. I love that album. Um, what else What else have I had on? Um, those were the last... Oh, I was listening to Sam Cooke. Um, oh, wow. Sometimes okay. I'll check out, like, okay. just, you know, new stuff, current stuff that's that's coming out. I was listening to uh, Jessica Pavone's string, string album. Um, wow. Just really anything. I have a big stack of stuff, vinyl and CDs, and just kind of choosing from that. Um, Nate Woolley's new album, I was just listening to. But C C Coltrane is endless, right? I, I listened to, yeah. to to Vanguard those recordings with Dolphy also yesterday. Oh actually. wow! Yeah, and it's just go back to that. <laughs> yeah, it, and it's always it's so fresh, and I'm just like, damn, you know. 
I have to play like this. I, you know, I want to improvise like this, and it's it always blows my mind how how good he was. Like, or the music has so much power. It's yeah, it's ridiculous. Incredible. But speaking of Cold Girl and composition and composing for players, I wanted to ask you about a connection with. You know, I've spoken with Mike Formanek, mm -hmm. and. Uh, You've played with him for such a long time in various formations, and also, also with Thomas Fujiwara. Mm -hmm. I, I see you have like these two rhythm sections, and the other is like John Ibear and Chess Smith in a way, which I love both of that, them. But uh, when did you hook up with Mike and Thomas? And I think you have like this, especially in Thumbscrew, this amazing chemistry going on. And That's speaking great. of Thumbscrew, when did that happen actually, that band? Um... I love it. So let's see. Well, Toma, I've been playing with for much longer. I met him in, I think, 2004, uh, playing with Matina Roberts and then playing a bunch with Taylor Hobynum. Yeah. Um, and Michael, I met a little bit later, um, although I've been a fan of his playing since I heard him play in Tim Burns' Blood Count uh, yeah. when I was in college. Um, I've always admired his playing. He's one of my favorite bass players. Um, and Toma, one of my favorite drummers as well. Um, and actually, it was it was through Taylor's band that I met, that I played with Michael for the first time, because mm. uh, Michael had subbed in one of Taylor's bands that Toma and I were both playing in. And the three of us just hit it off, like we felt that there was a chemistry there. So we did one of the, oh, we should get together and play sometime, uh, which, you know, people usually just say that and it, it doesn't happen, yeah, but actually yeah. we did make it happen. So we, we got together and we all had like written music. It felt like it happened very quickly, like we were all excited about it. So we got together and we all wrote some music, did some rehearsals, and um, yeah, now we're, I think we've we've released six records and we yeah. have a seventh one coming out next wow. month. Um, so it, oh, wow. I think it's, I, I really, I care about that band a lot. And what's great about it is that it's not always easy to keep collectives going for so long, yeah. um, but it feels like everybody's really invested in it and everybody's kind of doing the legwork to make things happen everybody's writing music so it, it feels like a, a pretty natural um Thank flow you. that that we can keep working together you know and it's nice you know none of us is a band leader so it's it's nice to have a project where you're not the leader but you're very invested in yeah it uh, seems like the, the growth and development of that project um so yeah. that's it's been awesome to work with those two the, but uh, you did like a record like a couple of months ago the braxton project <laughs> right yeah like, how did that one? I listened to that one the other day, and I loved it. I mean, I'm I'm a huge Braxton fan, of course. I mean, you've done so much also with him, and like, but how did you decide for for those compositions? And that's it's fun to hear actually actually his music, Braxton's music, in that format because it's quite different than I'm usually used to it. But how how did yeah. you decide for that that album actually? Like, so. His foundation, the Tricentric Foundation, um, had invited us along with several other groups to play his music as part of his 75th birthday, which was in June. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we were excited about the idea and we had an artist residency coming up at, at this organization, City of Asylum in Pittsburgh. So we knew we were going to be in Pittsburgh for a month working on music and we thought, great, we can do this Anthony Braxton project. Um, so we went to his archives. They've archived basically all of his scores wow. uh, and composition notes. And so that's in New Haven. So we went up to New Haven uh, and looked through the archive. And what we wanted to do was play a lot of his, uh, focusing on his early music, because a lot of it, he was writing music at such a fast pace that a lot of it never got performed. So there's all these old compositions that he might have written in the 70s that, that just never got played. Um, so almost all of the music that we chose is previously unrecorded. I think there were two compositions that were recorded one other mm -hmm. time. Um, and, and it was, it was a pretty amazing process just to look at these old scores. And then also we had some composition notes and trying to piece together and decipher what his intention was and, you know, trying to honor the music, but also do our own thing with it. And a lot of it was very difficult. We spent a lot of time. I mean, it, it really came together because we had this month-long artist residency yeah. and we were able to work on it every day. Uh, but it was. Did, did you really speak great. with? Did you speak with Anthony about that? Like also uh, about this project? Like, did you? 
ask him about those compositions at any point or? No, I mean, honestly, I don't know if he remember. you know, that it was so long. Oh, yeah, okay. I mean, we yeah. had his blessing to do it. Um, but yeah. no, we didn't okay. actually ask him about it during the process. Um, and, and it was interesting for me because I've worked with Anthony a lot, but he's always there. I've always played with him. I've never played his music when he wasn't. Yeah. So, so trying to, you know, just rely on my memory of working with him and what I think he would have wanted and, and you know, taking my best guess to, to try to yeah. honor the piece. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it was, it was really, really fun. Um, yeah, can I, I, it sounds like it. I mean, it sounds, sounds amazing. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you guys are already such a unit and then to put, I guess, one of your main mentors, of course, music on top of that, it's like, yeah, cream, and I think on, that's what cream on top of a cake. Or... That's what made it doable is that we felt comfortable together. You know, we felt very comfortable as a unit. And Michael and yeah. Toma also are, are big fans of his. Yeah. They both worked with him a little bit. Um, so we were able to to dive into it, you know, like you said, already as a unit, already having played yeah. together a lot. And I think it, it pushed us into some new spaces. Yeah. Uh, just having that different compositional voice. Yeah, you guys already did that in the past. Yeah, like that other others and your tune, ours and yeah, I love that what you do. But uh, speaking of uh, Anthony Braxton, like you know, uh, uh, it's probably a stupid question, but he was probably like really important for you. Of course, you you studied with Joe Morris and then Anthony Braxton. I think that's like the best possible yeah start for modern music. But can can you just like outline like what were how did you encounter Anthony, or how did you get in touch with him and studied with him, and how, how did these lessons look like? Um, well, he so he taught at the college I went to, Wesleyan University, mm -hmm. um, and I went there thinking I would study science. I didn't actually think I was going to become oh, a really? musician, oh. but I went there thinking I would study science, but also knowing they had a really good music department, so I could do some music as well while I was there, and. Um, and he was one of the one of the people that attracted me because I knew he taught there, and so I had checked out his music a little bit. Um, I think the first thing I heard when I was in high school was his his duo record with Derek Bailey, actually, which was yeah. amazing. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, live at Victoriaville. Yeah. And so I knew he was there, um, but then I, I just I, I don't think I understood quite how powerful it would be to to meet him and get a chance to study with him, um, which is why the science went out the window. <laughs> Yeah, can you imagine? I was just more interested in, in music. And I mean, I didn't study privately with him. I just took all his classes. Yeah. So he would offer, I mean, a lot of them were um, per performance classes. Like there was a class you could take every semester. So I took it every semester I was there, um, which had some funny name, like Materials and Principles of Jazz Improvisation. But basically what it was was a large ensemble. So there are probably 50, 60 kids in the class and you just play his music. Wow. So just being thrown, I mean, it really felt like just being thrown in the deep end, like just trying to understand conceptually what he was talking about and trying to read this crazy stuff. I mean, that's how I learned how to sight read was then taking these charts home and trying to wow. learn it um, and just under, you know, learning about the depth and the scope of his music and what he does. And he's such an inspiring, positive person to be around. He's just like lights up the room. So I think... Mm -hmm. I think for me, just he made music seem fun and he, he made it seem borderless, you know, just whatever you want. It's creativity. You don't have to be stuck in, in anything. You should honor traditions and take from traditions, but then go a step farther, do your own thing with it. And so that was yeah. sort of between him and Joe, you know, I, I feel very lucky. I had yeah. teachers that were encouraging that because it was and also giving me confidence because I had no confidence and I, I wasn't very good. And so right. having these people be like, no, 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 you can do this. Just keep working at it. Um, I think I really needed that at that time. So it was it was pretty amazing. I mean, for three years, I went there for three years um, and to be able to study with him and, and work with him. I mean, I think one semester I took four classes with him. I would just take everything that he offered. Yeah. Um, so that was amazing. And then I got a chance to work with him. Um, yeah. he how, would, how did that happen? I mean... I mean, he often hires his students um, yeah. because those are the people who've been learning his, I mean, his, his musical system is complex and um, he's not a big rehearser. He doesn't love to rehearse. So like, these are the people that understand his system and know his music. So he would often hire his students. So I, I, you know, I feel lucky I got to 
work with him. Um, yeah. And I played for many years in a trio with him and, and Taylor Hovinam, who is also a, a former student. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the, 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 but speaking of Anthony, I mean, like, or even Joe, like, when did your compositional, like, parts start to develop? Like, already, like, when you were studying at Wesleyan, Wesleyan like, or did, how, how much, like, let's say, Anthony inspire you to compose music? Um, I mean, he definitely inspired me a lot. I mean, I, I was writing, I've probably been composing since I was in high school, you know, just kind of simple, almost more like real booky tunes. Yeah. Um, and then sure. a lot of what I was doing in college was playing other people's music. Um, so playing Anthony's music or even transcribing, you know, mm. I would do a lot of transcribing or I remember I, I was really into John Zorn's Masada at that time. So we, we I, yeah. I had a band, we would transcribe a couple of those tunes and play those. I did and, that. Um, <laughs> you know, play some standards and, and freely improvise. And then we had some original compositions that we'd play. So it was, it was a lot of different stuff. I think at that point I was just trying to take in as much as I could. Um, yeah. And I started composing more after college when I moved to New York. Yeah. Uh, you know, I had a duo project with Jessica Pavone, the violist. Yeah. Um, that we still have, we just, <laughs> there's no gigs, but, yeah, uh, you sure. know, starting to write for that. I think that I started small, I started writing for duos and trios, small groups. And then, um, but I didn't actually release a, a record as a leader until I was like 28 or something. Um, that, that was started, Dra Dragon Scott. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then yeah. I started expanding, getting more interested in large scale composition. Yeah. Even though Anthony all along, Anthony was encouraging that from the beginning. You know, he always tells all his students, "You got to write for large orchestra and this and that." So I, I had that in my head, like, "Oh, you should do that." You're getting there. You started with a trio, <laughs> then it's like you know, like I think in three years it's gonna be like the I don't know, 19 piece uh, orchestra thing with horns yeah, or what. I mean, I have gradually been getting more into that type of thing. Yeah, just, just that makes sense. Having a bigger palette to yeah write for. But you mentioned New York when you moved to New York. How? When was that? It was like the 2005 or earlier? Uh, or? 2002. So it was the day yeah. I graduated. I moved to New York the next day. So that was May 2002. Oh, how was and that I like for you? I spent a year here because, uh, I mean, I've always loved New York. And um, I went to the new school for a year. Oh. I took a year off uh, from Wesleyan and I went to the new school for a year. So I lived in New York also in 2000. Um, when I was going to school there and then I moved back in, in 2000 yeah. and I've been here ever since same neighborhood yeah that's co so cool but when you when you went to New York how was it like for you in the beginning to 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 make the connections did you already know many people or how did that well, begin I actually did I when I moved back I, I knew a lot of people because I, I knew people from the new school from when I had gone to school there yeah. and I think just about everybody from Wesleyan ended up moving to New York. You know, the school's two hours from New York. So yeah. I knew a lot of people already. And then um, I met Jessica Pavone probably a few days after I moved here. She was my neighbor and we had mutual oh, wow. friends. Okay, so cool. like, I met her and I think I, I did feel like I already knew quite a few people. I was playing with Mike Pride, uh, the drummer, who yeah. also I met through the new school and Trevor Dunn, a uh, bass player. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I did feel like I knew people already and I was just so into going to concerts every night and um, I was working full time in an office. It was like a very busy few years um, yeah. just trying to yeah. trying to make a living and, and do everything. Yeah, that's incredible. Yeah, I love, I love always the, these stories of, you know, co coming to the city and like how it felt, how it feels like, you know, I, I've spoken to so many musicians like who are already like in their 60s or 70s, like, you know, Mark Elias and all these guys and Tim Byrne. And then you hear, you know, how it was in New York in 1981 or something. And I'm always like, wow, you know, yeah, like you hear all these incredible encounters that happened and all that. I, I love that. Oh, so. Yeah, I mean, it's changed so much. And I think the history of the city is pretty amazing. And just all yeah. the clubs that have come and gone and it's changing again now. I mean, we don't know what it's going to look like next year you know yeah definitely yeah it's a it's a bizarre one but 
Well, I, I think it'll be okay. <laughs> we'll, yeah. we'll manage. Jazz always survives in a way. But uh, we're talking about the, your study years. We're talking about your study years. And I wanted to ask you, like, to go even back. We mentioned before Johnny Smith. and But, you know, when I listen to you play, you, you have this kind of like this clear guitar sound with some effects. Well, the pitch and, you know, the tremolos and all, all, all that, some distortion even. But, like, who were like your main influences for guitar playing? Probably Joe Morris we mentioned, but like, what what, what did you listen to when you were a teenager? Actually, um, well, Jimi Hendrix was the first. That was the first yeah. guitarist I really loved. Well, um, cool. You know, what I was really into in high school actually was the Allman Brothers. I was super into the Allman Brothers, um, oh. the Beatles, um, and I was into a lot of grunge like. Uh, Oh, Nirvana, the Smashing Pumpkins. Alice in Chains is one of my favorite events. Um, so, and then Wes Montgomery was the first jazz guitar player. Oh. Um, I, I really fell in love with probably in high school. Um, but I don't know. I mean, I actually didn't, aside from those bands, when I was listening to jazz, I wasn't really listening to a lot of guitarists early on. Mm -hmm. I kind of came more around to jazz guitar later. Although Jim Hall was another one. I love Jim Hall. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I was listening to Miles Davis, John Coltrane, Thelonious Monk, and Bingus, and um, Dolphy, and yeah. uh, Ornette. So it was for me, it was a lot more horn players that, that I was taking influence from. But is there um, like a jazz record that you still go back to that you would say like, it's like one of your like turnaround records that kind of set in your mind like, wow, I really want to learn how to do that? or. Uh, I mean, there were a few, there were probably a few records that made me fall in love with jazz. It, it would have been um, Miles Davis, Kind of Blue. These were like records my dad had. That, that uh, okay. Out. Uh, Blue Train by John yeah. Coltrane. And there was a, a monk, Thelonious Monk, the composer. Oh, okay. I think that was the first, those were the first three that, and I didn't love them at first. I had to listen to them like a hundred times and then I, because I didn't understand it. Yeah. Um, but then I think, and I think this is like this with a lot of music that isn't easy listening. Um, it's just, the more you hear it, the more you, you start to grasp just how much there is going on. Yeah. Not that you ever fully understand it, but you gradually kind of start to hear all these different layers of things. So I remember just playing those records over and over and over again at a certain point and then starting to just get so into it, you know, and then, oh, Rasan Roland Kirk, I was really into in high school as well. Oh, really? Oh, wow. Interesting. Um, so, yeah, it, it, it was a gradual thing for me, for sure. Yeah, that's, that's quite cool. But uh, I, I want, wanted to ask you also about your solo guitar. Not to take too much of your time, but like, uh, just like, I love what you did on Melframe and I just, wanted to ask it's kind of connected maybe even to the what we started with with free impro or but like uh how, how do you approach solo guitar playing or how did you approach that album it sounds like this little vignettes that are happening and you know we, on the one hand there's like almost a punk groove that you do or then it's like a grunge you mentioned grunge i, I, I get this grungy idea sometimes of it and even, but how, how did you approach that solo guitar record? I mean, Melt Frame, I'm really curious about that. Um, I mean, I, I didn't do a solo record for a long time because I had no ideas or no real concept for it. And then when I decided to do it is when I realized it would be fun to try to do covers. So the, the concept was basically all covers, so covers of any sort. I mean, there's a tune by Chris Lightcap, a tune by Tom yeah. Kutora, a tune by Duke Ellington, uh, Roscoe Mitchell, um, Carla Blay. So I, I think I, I took all these different <laughs> tunes that I liked, um, whether they were standards or, or kind of contemporary compositions or something in between, um, and, and just tried to find different ways to adapt them for solo guitar. So I think when I when I figured out that that's what I wanted to do, it, it became a really interesting challenge. So I had a lot of different tunes and then just playing around with them, seeing what worked. Like the, the yeah. opening tune on the record is Cascades by Oliver Nelson. Um, but I, for that one, I took a totally different approach. I didn't make it more of like a punk distorted thing, just playing that line that he plays. Um, yeah. I love that yeah. 
all of them are just records that I love, songs that I love and trying to adapt them. I mean, I think doing covers is is really challenging because usually if you cover yeah, a song, definitely. it's because you love it so much. So what can you do to something that's already perfect? You know, it's, yeah. I think it's challenging. So I didn't, I, I tried to avoid doing like a cheap imitation of the tune and instead of taking like some, something about the energy of the tune that I loved and right. trying to do something a little different with it. Yeah. Uh, and then just trying to have as much variety as possible, you know, cause it's, it's all one sound, it's all guitar. So yeah, think about exactly. orchestrating, actually thinking really uh, compositionally and like how can I have the most variety as possible so that the palette of guitar is is fairly wide. It's not just like yeah. the same sound each each song. No, it's a, I, I, was, I spoke also to Miles Okazaki like three weeks ago and you know the month project he did. It's and crazy. we just spoke about, yeah, it's it's beyond but like what I love what he did and we spoke about that like that he wasn't afraid of playing like single lines you know even throughout one whole co composition of Monk which is actually true you know he said like I think Steve Lacey if he, if he can do like on a saxophone like a Monk tune or a Monk, Monk solo album actually you know you can do that even on, on guitar without having you know I don't know Joe Paz behind your hat or Ben Munder or whoever Ralph Downer like, Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the thing you know. about guitar is that there, there's so much you can do. And yeah. I think sometimes that can be intimidating of, of, yeah, it's a chordal instrument and it's a line instrument and you have all these predecessors doing this amazing solo guitar yeah. music. But yeah, yeah, I like that of, of not having the pressure to, to do it in a certain way and be like, yeah, I could, don't have to play chords at all if you don't want to, or you could play, you could just strum the whole time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I love that. Yeah, but the, the, speaking of, of sound, like, I just wanted to ask you also this, like, did you, were you aware of your sound already from the beginning? Like, when you started, like, that I have to work on my sound in a sense, because you have like a really, which is really heavy, I think, nowadays, in, especially in the guitar world, I guess. You know, there are so many guitarists, I don't know, Kurt Rosenwinkel came out, everyone sounded like this delay kind of sound, this, you know, guitar, but there there aren't many guitarists who are really recognizable as you and i wanted to ask you like how did you start working on your guitar sound like were you aware of that when you started already or i mean i think that for me that goes back to joe morris and braxton who were yeah. encouraging me to try to do that so I've, I've always tried to do that i still try to do that of just develop something um that feels personal or that feels unique yeah. to you you know without any pressure but just trying to um trying to and a lot of what i've done over the years is try to write my own exercises on guitar um, oh. so i can try to you know further ideas that that i've come up with myself i found that to be the best way to develop ideas is just uh, what, what are they <laughs> share please. i mean they're not even specific it's not like i have a book of them it's more just like if i play something that i like to try to to stop and, and be like oh that was cool and then try to turn it into some kind of an exercise Oh, so I'll do a lot okay. of things with metronomes, like repeating something over and over, or maybe it's it's some like simple concept, but maybe it's like hitting open strings in the middle of a line and turning that into some kind of an exercise, mm. um, because I like doing that when I play. Um, so just trying to take the time to think about what you play that you feel is personal or, or, or that you like, and it doesn't have to be some complicated thing. It could be a very simple idea, um, but just trying to take the time to to really focus and develop that i always find depth for me depth is the way to go you know taking mm. forever to really work on something until it's a part of your sound rather than skipping yeah. over a lot of stuff I, I learned that after many years of not doing that that i'd rather really focus when i'm practicing and yeah. you know that's for me that's the best way to do it yeah definitely okay just just one one last question mary so that, uh it, it's like you, you've done so much work, it's so, you know, it's so hard to follow what you've done already in, in the last year. Like so, some records that I thought are new are basically really old in your, in your discography already. But uh, I just wanted to ask you, being a band leader, do you like being a band leader? And uh, do you approach being a band leader or versus a collaborator or a site woman? How would you put these two on the scale? 
Um, I mean, I like it all. I, I think I like doing a combination of things. I'm not sure I'd ever want to only lead bands. Um, although I am trying to kind of cut down what I do and do a little bit less so I can, I can focus a little bit more on that. Yeah. Um, but I, I really like being a, a side woman as well because I like to be able to learn from other, you know, you, you draw inspiration from the music of your peers. You know, I'm, I'm influenced yeah, by sure. all of my peers and all the people I work with. So for me, it's nice to have a combination because also band leading is exhausting. It's a lot more yeah. work, a lot more responsibility. Um, so I think having some kind of balance for me is important because I, I really do enjoy all of it. And for band leading, you know, I try to do a really good job. And I, what I try to do is think about the other band leaders I've worked with and what did I like and what did I not like and how they approached it. And, you know, over the years through trial and error, trying to get better at it and, and trying to do it in a way that you feel is, you know, treating the musicians in your band, yeah. with, you know, respect, respect and giving them freedom and making the experience fun. And, um, you know, just really trying to have a good time being on the road. Yeah. And, that's really name. important too. do you remember your first band leading experience like how was that like you know when you called i don't know like chess smith and john Aber, yeah, and like okay guys, here's, here's the music and oh i was so stressed out <laughs> i mean it's it's a little bit easier for me now because i've had years yeah, of experience doing definitely. it but you know it's like yeah that first one it's like everything's on you or that's how you feel you know it's like yeah. oh the flight's canceled what are you going to do you know, and having to kind of deal yeah. with these, everything's going wrong every day, something goes wrong, you know, so yeah. having to kind of, you know, if you don't have a tour manager or something, having to trouble, troubleshoot all these things and make sure, you know, and now when it, ha it still happens now, but I'm just a little bit more equipped to deal with it, I think. Uh, you, you, your your skin, skin gets a little bit more thicker, I guess. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's, it's, it's heavy. I, I remember we did this one with a bear and Gerald Cleaver and Don and we played in Belgium and they put us in a really shitty hotel like and I, I was, the guys were like checked and were like, no we're not doing that and you know you're younger than I was like oh man what do I do now and then yeah. you know it's, these things happen and it's like okay focus work now you know it's yeah, funny it's, it's tough I mean I've had those too where it's I, I think I wouldn't have known how to deal with that when I was in my 20s, but yeah, yeah. Like, oh, this is unacceptable. I mean, yeah, I've had that too, ones with like cockroaches all over the floor and it's like, no, you, you know. No, yeah. It's always something, never a dull moment. <laughs> yeah, definitely not. <laughs>